So welcome to lecture 11. Um, we'll finish the um, on-the-job search model, and then we'll proceed to talk about, in a, in a way of introduction, um, the role of heterogeneity in these types of models with on-the-job search. So we're getting very close to maybe some, some realistic model, and the, the insight you should be getting is that the more realistic the model is, the more complicated it is, unfortunately, because this this notion of introducing um, individual decisions in a way that is sustainable in the sense of producing a long-run distribution of wages in a way that's consistent with firm behavior that's in some sense optimal is difficult. It's really difficult. And everyone knows that search, the, the, the contribution of search theory is to think of the, of the, of the, um, the search relationship or the match relationship as being in an investment decision, accepting a, a match is, a, is an investment, and, uh, and searching is an investment. And um, you, when you're searching, you're in a dis disadvantaged position, and you're trying to make yourself better off, and opening yourself up to um, alternatives, and some alternatives are definitely not, not leading to an improvement of your situation, some are. So in this sense, um, when you're working, you're, you're all also being exposed to alternatives that are possibly better, possibly worse than you have, uh, than the job you have, and knowing about that as an unemployed person is, is really interesting and important. So that, that's the, the, the key, you know, key aspect of, of on-the-job search in the first instance. It affects the, the long-run equilibrium rate of unemployment even though it's not about offers in unemployment. It's about getting out of unemployment and changing the value of having a job. Now, the only drawback of this, this beautiful theory of Burdett and Mortensen is that it produces a wage distribution that isn't so great. So today we'll be sort of giving you an idea of how we can get, get, better, get better models. Um, but again, the beauty of this model is really the, you know, the pure homogeneity of, of workers and firms in the, in the thing. It's, it's just an amazing idea. Um, so we start with um, some general remarks about wages and wage determination, like what I did before, about monopsony and wage posting. Um, we'll uh, think about, we'll re-derive what we did last time, so in some of this will be repeat, and then we'll actually derive the F in detail, and then show you some of the implications of that for, um, well, for the key fundamental determinants of the distribution and for efficiency. So one of the key un unadvertised aspects of this model is that um, this search model with uh, on-the-job search actually has uh, very little to say about, um, about um, efficiency except the fact that the, the inefficiency comes from the frictions. So getting rid of Getting rid of the, um, of the lower bound implied by the reservation level of, of, of utility for workers can actually shift the entire distribution. So that means that you know, if you introduce a minimum wage, it doesn't really have any efficiency implications in this model. Okay, just basically, it, it kind of strengthens the worker's uh, fallback position and ends up giving more surplus to the workers. Okay, so some people use this as a, as a as, and the reason for that is that the, the wage posting model obviously is, is a little bit like a monopsony model. The firms post a wage, the workers accept it or, or reject it, and in the, in the Robinson monopsony model, the, the workers um, reject the interest, enjoy leisure, and, and with perfect certainty, and here the workers could reject it with the prospect of getting something better, but it's very similar except um, we know that in the monopsony model of Robinson there's, there's um, inefficiency of monopsony power and getting rid of that is also an improvement in efficiency. So moving to the competitive outcome is a great thing in everyone's opinion who's not a, a corporate uh, um, chill. <laughs> so we think that, uh, but in this case it's different. I mean, pushing up the, it's like pushing up B would be um, just giving the workers more more of the, a share of the pie, even though the workers are at a disadvantage, maybe because of the frictions. The frictions generate the, the distribution uh, between the firm and the worker in this model. 
Okay, so let's let's talk about last time quickly. We 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 did what we'll do in detail today. We we showed reminded you how the job search model with on the job search or the search model with on the job search transforms um, the offered wage distribution into an observed distribution, and it's really important that you understand the logic behind that. It's a uh, it gives rise to a functional equation that links uh, g to f and it links it at every point in the distribution using the definition of a cumulative distribution. Okay, so all wages paying up to W, you have some inflows, you have some outflows, and in equilibrium those have to be equal for the distribution to be stable, and that has to be true for all W on the support. Okay, so that, that is a really neat way of, of deriving, a, and it's a great, it's a, something that's going to help us later, um, sort of doing the causality between, uh, between F and G implied by this particular model. And, and I wanted to mention again that this is all about a certain way of, of thinking about how the, the pie gets distributed because when workers and firms meet, only then can you actually have something happen and it's a one zero. There's no, well, let's do 50-50 um, or let's produce half of the productivity. You're gonna, gonna wanna produce the entire productivity of the match because um, the friction implies that if you break up, you're going to have to start from scratch. You have nothing. You're, you're wasting time doing nothing, searching. Um, so if you're together, there's going to be, you're going to go to the max. It's a zero, one. We produce it full productivity, and there is no marginalism in this model. Okay, so um, that means that whoever sets the wage actually has a lot of power. So the firm is posting the wage. The firm, you know, gets to dictate under what conditions the worker will turn away. You can imagine a world where you're talking about rock stars or you know, DJs and clubs in Berlin, they basically can, can determine their price. I mean, they're, they're in demand enough, they say, I'll take 10,000 for this gig, take it or leave it, and then the, the club says, well, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> and it depends, on, uh, it depends on how that power got distributed. It seems to be something we can't really explain. You know, there's a, there are lots of theories about how how these institutions arise, but usually we have the price setter um, is the is the seller um, in these models, but it doesn't have to be that way. And you could imagine, um, we'll talk about that later, you could imagine even some sort of mixed equilibrium, I think you're thinking about that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're gonna stick to the wage posting because it seems to be what we observe. So the, the empirical data on this, um, there are some, there's uh, interesting work on it's been going on for years, actually, on asking what firms do. I think the late Alan Kruger was also involved in this uh, or the Ashen Felter. Uh, if you ask firms, how do your wages get set? Most of them say, we just call out the wage. We have a wage schedule. Maybe the unions are involved in, in Germany, but there's still like a wage schedule. So the worker shows up, there's a, there's, a, there's a potential match, and the worker just gets faced with this wage offer. Truman Bewley in the United, in the United States did a comprehensive survey of, of employers and found the same thing. So it's, it's really crazy for us economists to think of the competitive model as being the only paradigm out there. Okay, A lot of people say, well, we have union models, but that's also a very, very biased way of looking at it because the unions have all the power, and that's also not true. Maybe you have some sort of bargain. In, in reality, it seems to be that the firms are calling the wage, and workers are... Uh, exploiting whatever mobility they have to, to avoid bad offers. And the equilibrium we discussed already will be implying a very atomistic behavior of, of the firms and the workers. So you'd, you have only very local monopsony power. The firm calls out a wage, um, and the firm could enjoy a profit. So if the firms could come together across the distribution and start a, an employer's association, they could raise the wage. It's a different model. It's not in this model. You can write down the profit maximization problem for a, an employer's association. I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little bit too much now, but I think it's important that you get this because the burdett mortensen model imposes perfect competition across the distribution. But I see Germany, we have employer's associations, okay? And we, all, we also have labor unions, but we all really have employer associations. Those guys don't ignore wage policy. They don't talk about competing on wages, they talk about wage, they talk about labor shortages, which means that at my posted wage, I'm not getting any workers. Hi, well, <laughs> too bad. No. So um, this is extremely interesting from my point of view, but um, under re 
researched. Uh, I think there are huge gains, and we know this from, from looking at the United States. Actually, there's some very interesting new studies on the internet um, because a lot of job pl platforms also have wage posting, um, and there's some that don't. And sometimes they're owned by the same company. <laughs> so they probably use one to derive the distribution to exploit the other. But in any case, the, um, you know, we really have to ask the... I, I love the competitive model. I was raised on it. Uh, it's, it's Hicks, you know, uh, Marshall, blah, blah. And you, some of you have seen it, um, but it's not the only model out there. It's a good benchmark. And the reason is, of course... And we'll see this in this, in this Burdett and Mortensen case, is that uh, it can explain the diamond paradox. If we have unemployment that's search-related, then it, doesn't, it seems to be a puzzle that we even have a non-degenerate distribution of observed wages, because as information gets out there, firms learn, and if in the case we consider the, the, uh, the level of income in, um, or the, in, in the pecuniary value of unemployment uh, without a job for the worker, it's B. If, if, that, if this gets out and B is the same across workers, then firms will just post B and they'll get all the surplus. So that's kind of the, I mean, there's no reason, even if they don't collude, they would do that because they know the workers have B as their best alternative on employment. Um, and you know that if alpha zero is equal to alpha one, then this is an outcome of the model, right? So. I mean, Diamond didn't work with Burdett Mortensen, um, but he got the he got the Nobel Prize with Diamond Mortensen. So it's as if they were communicating. But Diamond was like 20 years before, or something like that, uh, thinking about this issue. Uh, and Diamond was thinking about a general wage price posting problem. It wasn't really necessarily a labor, right? Okay, so long introduction. You get the get the picture. Um, we. Last time we cursorily derived a continuous time set up as we have been for the past few weeks. Uh, we derived the reservation wage um, under the assumption the worker knows that the worker can get a job and get even a, a continue to have access to j job op offers while working. And this rate of arrival can be equal to or less than or greater than the arrival rate when you're unemployed. And that's, a, that's an important uh, point. And the key innovation is that when workers uh, receive those uh, offers, they receive from the same wage distribution as before. So it's kind of assuming that the wor worker's sort of options are determined by her own attributes and not some sort of, um, maybe some sort of discrimination or, I mean, none of those are our attributes, but it's, it's kind of, it's the worker's thing and workers are all the same, so it shouldn't be um, shouldn't be contingent on the worker's history, for example. And of course, the un unemployed accept and reject, but the employed workers can reject, but it has no consequence, right? It doesn't matter. If, if you're working and you get a, a job offer that's lousy, you can just ignore it. Whereas in the, the precursor model as an introduction, which I think is also kind of interesting, you can get a wage reduction and you can still accept it because you know, you're, maybe you're 60 years old and yeah, you know, as productive as you used to be, but it's better than being unemployed, so you, you take the wage cut. We see this in the, in the world, actually, but um, also for professors. Um, <laughs> uh, but in this model, it doesn't matter. Okay, so you just, you just ignore it. And doing that, we gave us the, the ability to derive, which we will now do, um, this observed distribution, which is the only datum we have. We don't have any data on offers try to get people to talk about them, but people forget, you know. I, I got some offers and I just can't even remember, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But the distribution, we can get it from the social security data, we can survey workers that are working and say, hey, what are you earning? And if you don't know what you're earning, you're kind of stupid. So it's, it's easy to get this one. So we have to infer F uh, from, uh, from G, so we need a theory to do that. Yeah. So in this model, the productivity of the worker is Given and fixed and doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Right. It doesn't it doesn't change on the job either? That's an that's the next section of this course. We talk about the exactly. some ideas of, of uh, an evol evolving match productivity. Mm -hmm. So I meet this great firm and we come together and <coughs> that's one interpretation. Or we uh, 
the firm learns about me that I'm actually a pretty good worker. I just didn't show it in an interview, so I, you, can, you can have that sort of thing. So that's a different interpretation of the whole wage profile. Remember, in this model, the wage profile is positive within a tenured uh, employment spell because you keep getting bombarded with these wage offers, and some of them are actually attractive. Okay, and in this model, you if you accept them, you've moved up the wage ladder. So again, that's the interpretation that it's a single firm and not a changing firm thing. So the model is, is intentionally ambiguous on, on that. And it is possible to interpret the point on the distribution as being a firm. So getting a higher wage means you're kind of, a, um, you know, you're, you're, if, if, if you're a lot of people earning your wage, that means you're in a, at, a, at a big firm that has a wage post that's maybe um, high enough to attract and not high enough to to be unprofitable, but within firm distributions, we, we don't have this model. You have a question? Okay. So this is this is the uh, the logic, right? And then today we're going to go into detail how to get the how to get the F going, because we've shown how F leads to G, but to do it properly in a general equilibrium type of sense, we want to actually go from G to F with minimalist assumptions. So let's just go through the math a little bit, a little. Um, <clears throat> given F, we have this equality uh, implication for, of, of inflows and outflows, and it's pretty easy to understand that if you, if you enter from unemployment, you can enter at any place across the, the distribution conditional on getting the offer, and that would be the inflow. And the outflow, of course, you can leave um, your position in the CDF, that is, you can earn your position in the mass or your, your membership in the mass of employment of workers earning no more than W if uh, you get sacked involuntarily with, with rate lambda or if you get a job offer that pulls you out of the distribution below W and puts you in the higher point. Okay, so that's just an inflow outflow. That's the whole logic of, of what we do today. And in general, the whole since the beginning of the course, Pissarides model. Okay, so we can solve for G because it's kind of a separable setup. The distribution in uh, in work does not is not affected by your, your offer distribution by assumption. So you have this, you can actually solve for G, and you get this beautiful formula. Um, and you have to apply the the formula for the steady state because we're always talking about the steady state of unemployment. We already did that last week. So you plug it in. You get this G, and then you say, well, we know that uh, by construction, no one's going to be working for less than their own reservation wage. All workers are the same, so we won't observe any uh, unusual cases. This will not be the case when you have heterogeneity. You might have workers who are really desperate to work. They have a very low B, and even though the other guys have a high B, they're going to accept whatever they get. And that's why you'll have, in a, model, in a richer model of heterogeneity, you'll have very low, possibly low-paying jobs related to the individualized willingness to work. We haven't gotten there yet. That's the end of this lecture. We'll talk about that. Okay, but in this model, everything is just, everyone's the same. It's really wonderful. Uh, no wages um, lower than, than WR. Okay, and WR falls out of the, out of the unemployment uh, optimization for the, the Bellman equation for the uh, unemployed worker. We impose the, the conditions on G to make sure it's a, a CDF. So it has to, remember, you should know this by heart. G of the bottom is equal to zero, G of the top is equal to one, and the first derivative is non-negative. Okay, you can have flats, but that would imply that in that density uh, region, the, the, the F, little f is zero, and that's kind of hard to imagine. Think of little f as the, the rate of change of, of, big G, of big F, or little g as the rate of change of big G as you move through the, the support. The only, the only really key stuff in, in this model um, that d drives it, basically, is are these arrival rates, right? You have this arrival rate for unemployed people and an arrival rate for, for people in work, and that, that you can think of lots of economic reasons that might be the case, right? There's a, there's a theory of, um, of ranking, uh, I think Blanchard and, uh, and Diamond actually worked on this uh, in the 1990s or 2000s. Um, 
the idea that if you're unemployed, you sort of have a you have a brand on your head that says, oh, you're kind of different. For some reason you're unemployed, and, uh, and it's true. I mean, we don't know why you lost your job. You might have lost your job because of a, of a bankruptcy, or you might have lost your job because you misbehaved. And if you misbehave, the employer doesn't want to have you. That's the that's the theory. <clears throat> So this model kind of admits something like that. If you're in unemployment, you have this brand, and as soon as you get out of the unemployment uh, pool, you, you lose the brand. You lose the, the mark on your forehead or on your, on your, and somewhere else on your body. And then you basically, um, you can go through different possibilities, and we, we started with this really easy one, which is that the, there is no dis there's no discrimination in terms of offer rates. The, the wage distribution is the same, so we can derive directly this G, Beautiful formula. It's related to the incidence rate, it's, um, which is common, and the separation rate. So it looks a little bit like our friend before, right? Um, now we're going to use that in this particular simple case just to derive the offer distribution. So again, we're just, I'm kind of repeating what I did, but I'm going to go into more detail and explain a bit more, and then we'll see how this gives us an ability to reverse engineer everything we've we've discussed as being potentially relevant, especially the shape of the, of the wage distributions. So we're going to use, we'll use G that is implied by F to get back at F. So if we have two equations and two, uh, two functional equations and two functions, we could have a shot at finding the answer. Remember, this is really a special model in my view because we only have two frictions. In this case, we have three frictions that we allow for different arrival rates, but here we have a common arrival rate. Okay, so think of, again, we've, we've done this already. I um, just repeat myself. Under the case of equality, we have the reservation wage is equal to the, the value of uh, time, um, or the, the, the flow, the pecuniary value of, uh, to the worker, and then you can derive explicitly these, uh, these inflows and outflows. Now we're going to go back and think about what a firm would consider those implications. The firm kind of knows, think of F as being the offer distribution that's going to arise in, as a result of behavior by firms. And every point on that distribution you could think of as either an individual firm um, with constant returns to scale, or you could think of it as a bunch of firms, and then the density of the firms paying little w would be an equilibrium implication of what everyone else is doing. So every, each, each poster, each wage poster, understands that there's something else going on in the rest of the distribution that has implications for the way workers behave. Okay, and that's, that, that's the key thing. So the, the firm understands that if it posts wage little w, it's going to have a probability of, of attracting workers from unemployment, and that's going to basically, um, uh, but you know, the workers are already there. Um, the firm has to worry about paying a wage that's too low. First off, the worker's going to be, if the worker's employed by the firm and <clears throat> an exogenous separation occurs, there's nothing the firm can do. So with the rate lambda, those guys are going to leave every, every instant, every period. And then you have this implication of your wage posting policy. We talk about wage, um, we talk about wage poaching. That's the, the new the new word for the day, poaching, which is like what happens when hunters go into. Uh, I think the Germans call it wildern. You, know, you sort of go into some some piece of land that doesn't belong to you and start shooting birds and, and animals uh, without paying the owner. That um, it's the same thing in in. in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, poaching means you're just stealing. Uh, so here, you, these are the these are the workers that got that get stolen. Um, if a with with arrival probability or intensity alpha, an arrival arises and that wage arrival is higher than the worker's current wage, the worker disappears. So the worker firm loses the worker, and that occurs with one minus f of w, the top end of the distribution. So we have those two potential costs of paying any wage. You can see the higher wage, the, the higher wage you pay, the, the more you can reduce the loss by poaching. <clears throat> this is called the retention rate. 
right? So you, the higher wage you, you post, like with Google, you pay really high wages, you don't lose any workers. It has great advantages, but it also has a disadvantage. You have lots of workers, you, you have to pay lots of wages. <laughs> And um, that's the disadvantage. And again, this is a one man, one firm, a one woman, one firm uh, case, but in general, uh, this can be generalized. We have constant returns, so it doesn't matter. Uh, now suppose you um, don't have a worker. How does that look? Well, you're gonna get an exogenous pool of workers that, that just come up to you and accept it because they're unemployed. And you can't affect that because you can't do, you can't um, post different wages for different for employed and unemployed workers in this model. So you're gonna you're gonna you're, you're, you know you, the, the the firm strategy is simple is is a is a, a singleton. It's just a wage. And you can post a high wage or a low wage, and whatever wage you post, you're gonna get these people coming in from unemployment, and that's gonna depend on their behavior whether they um, have a high value of unemployment or not. So that part is. It's just going to be a and, and it's the same as the reservation wage. So whatever that is, my arrival rate is going to be basically lambda divided by lambda plus alpha. And then you've got these people who come from below my posted wage, um, and that would be the people who are employed one minus u star times um, the cumulative distribution below my wage post. Okay, so I can and I and you can. G is increasing in, in W, and you know, technically it's non increasing, uh, non decreasing, but it's um, in our case it's going to be increasing for the distributions we consider. So if I pay higher wages, <clears throat> I'm going to be likely to get people at the door who accept, because some of my offers will be hitting these lower wage guys and they'll come in, right? So you can see it's it's a great economics problem. You have marginal gain and marginal cost. Uh, everybody knows you pay, firms don't like to pay high wages because it hurts their profits, and this is just works fine. But the worker, the firm knows that paying high wages can increase its um, retention probability, and also increase its ac its acquisition, its poaching ability. So this is the this is the poaching. The second term of this this uh, second line is the poaching, the massive or the the flow of poachings successful poaching efforts uh, that result, okay? So, you know, we use the definition of U star again and then just plug it in so we can write the, the probability of getting a worker is, again, a, a nice, elegant expression. We'll use that in a second. Now, a firm is now considering entering. This is, this is how you derive the distributions. You're, you're at an entry point. You, haven't, you don't have anything. You have a, you have the decision to take which W do I post with all the consequences, positive and negative, including getting someone in the door in the first place. When I just post the wage, I don't have any worker. So you have to do this properly. If you already have a worker, we'll derive the profits, and then we'll derive the profits for not having a worker, and then we'll take some, uh, we'll impose some, some indifference conditions on that. So let's, to, to get the, the, the expected profits without having anyone on hand, you need to find out what is the value of having someone in hand, and then we'll apply the probability of getting that worker in the first in the first period. So, if you have, conditional on having a worker, we use the geometric sum formula. Okay, because I have the worker, so it's, I can only lose the worker, and then I have to I have nothing. And so, calculating this. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We use beta as a discount factor. You get paid at the end of the period. Remember, there's a little bit of tension here because the firm is is acting in discrete time, and, and our model assumes continuous time for the worker. But it doesn't matter. It just makes it a little bit easier to play with. Okay? Because in the end, the strategy space for the firm is simply posting a wage and not changing it. It's just a, I'm going to be a high paid. I'm going to be a high wage firm or employer or I'm going to be a low wage employer. So think of the first period, and then the period of conditional on getting uh, the worker, and if I lose the worker, I have nothing, so I have zero to start from scratch. Okay, so you can, it's just a very trivial um, PDV calculation. And why is it approximately? Well, there's, a, there's always the issues of, of little r and products of, of 
R and other other small numbers. So it's we'll just take that as a as a as a start as the as the approximation from the, the position of having uh, profit that I expect to have hold, having the worker in hand. And if I'm now entering, I've got a I've, I've got no worker, so I have nothing. Um, I could have productivity y if I did have a worker. So I have to have a probability of finding a worker, and then the times the expected profitability with that worker from that from the end of that period um, going on going forward. Okay, so it's straightforward enough. And you can show, and this is what my remark at the very beginning, the profits are not monotonic in W, so they're, if I could actually control all the workers and they're coming to me, I could be a monopsonist, and this would be, uh, in like in the John Robinson problem, it would be, a, be like a concave function of W. So at some point I, I, I'm, I'm uh, paying too much, and at some pay, point I'm pay, paying too little, so I pay exactly the right amount here. Um, you get the same outcome, but now the firm has no market power except for the market power at the at the match. Okay, so um, the brilliant aspect of Burdett Mortensen is to sort of say, uh, given that, um, we can still have some implications for the, the the equilibrium if all firms take into account the consequences of what everyone else is doing, even though they can't affect what they're doing. So this is not a model of oligopsony. But it's a model of, of of monopolistic competition with extremely high um, uh, elasticity of uh, well, the elasticity of supply to the firm is, de is determined only by the, the frictions. It's not determined by workers' behavior. Or the elasticity of labor supply. So it's kind of you know this is really smart because it's saying okay I'm I'm about to enter and I'm deciding what should my wage post be. Then I have perfect freedom to post whatever wage I want. But I know that if I post a high wage, I'm not going to have much profit. I'll be giving these highly retained workers a lot of my money. Okay, and that's that's going to be profitable to some extent because I won't have any loss due to poaching. But I'm I could actually pay less. And then if you, if I decide to pay very little, I'll be losing workers all the time, and I'll be gaining some workers from unemployment, but I won't be keeping them very long. So there's a huge trade-off. And then. Again, the, the key assumption in Burdett Mortensen is to assume that um, an equilibrium would impose an equality of expected profits across that distribution, even though there's no coordination. Okay, so it's just the, the fact that we all have the same information, we're all pretty smart, and we're about to enter, and we say, okay, and then you have a randomization equilibrium. So it's basically, you know, if you pay a high wage, you get this profit, you pay a low wage, I'm indifferent between the two, and the equilibrium imposes that. And the only thing that reflects the the relative strength and weaknesses of the of the offer will be the mass at that wage. So a lot of firms may, a lot of individual employers will post a uh, sort of a medium wage because it has a, the high, you know, a lot of guys can fit into that part of the distribution. And at the end points, you might have lower lower um, firms offering that wage. Okay, this is what we call Corno price setting it's because you you had this in micro probably in the extreme case when. When, when if you're talking about setting the price of, uh, of apples at a stand, um, you know, if you set an epsilon higher price for apples, you lose everybody in the classic Cournot situation. But if there's any friction, Cournot is not right in the sense that in a, a non-competitive, if you have frictions, the frictions create this, nah, okay, I'll, well, maybe I'll take a slightly higher price of apples because I'm, I'm done, you know, I've got my apples, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Or the apples maybe <laughs> don't run away from me. <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's the that's the, uh, the the breaking point of this this uh, analogy with with the, with the product market. The cool thing about labor is that workers can decide, right? The workers can also do something. So great. Okay, so imposing equality of expected profits across the distribution under these explicit conditions, ex explicitly strict conditions. Equality of arrival rates out of a job in a job, with the uh, implication that W R equal, equals B, then we can look at the bottom because we know that B has to be the lowest point of the observed and the offer distribution. So the offer distribution has to start at B, 
And then there's a profit. I mean, if I want to be a total jerk employer, I could, I could post workers alternative uh, income and unemployment. And I would get some people. I would get the first entrance out of um, unemployment, but I'd get very little retention. As soon as those guys are there, they just get something else from outside and they're gone. So there won't be, it, won't be that very, it won't be that profitable, but it will have some profit. It has some expected profit. And in, in, in this model, that is the benchmark for profitability of all the other strategies. They all have to have the same expected profit. And that's the key. So you have this, you can, you can push that condition across the potential wage offers in the distribution. Okay? And then you can even, you know, once you do that, for any W that's greater than B, any wage post that's greater than B, up to the top, even though we don't know what the top is, we can derive it. Okay, so the first thing is we have this, this indifference condition for indifference meaning um, equal profit, equal zero um, excess profit um, condition for the firm wage offer, and then we can solve for F, and the last step, I'll show you in a second, would be to assume for the, the value for which F of one, um, uh, F of W equals one, so we can solve for the top of the distribution. You had a question? Yeah, can you explain again how it is uh, possible that all the firms are the same and they all have the same profit maximization problem with the same parameters, but then they all optimize for the same variable, which is W, but then... End no, up they don't the optimize. Remember, that, that, that's a, that was a, the key thing I said at the beginning of the lecture. This is not a monopsony model, so the firm doesn't choose the W um, in a sense that, well... Uh, at any point in the future, I could change my W, you know, it, and it, there's no... The consequences of having a different wage policy occurs because of what the other guys are doing. So it's as if they were competing with each other, they are competing with each other, but they're not coordinating. It's a different, it's a different setup. I mean, if everyone set the same wage, then it would be profitable for me to set a lower wage, attract some of the people who, because obviously I'm not, it's, it's, it may look optimal, but it's not optimal given that I can, uh, attract, I can, I can make more money by paying a lower wage and get a, a margin, I'll get, some, I'll get some attrition. I can also offer a higher wage. So I mean, much of the burdett Morrison model is based on this continuity argument. We start with, a, we start with this, um, you know, the, a true equilibrium to, to impose indifference. And again, we're talking about before the fact, before we enter the market, um, we're all sort of sitting at a, at a table. We can't see each other. We can't communicate, but we sort of communicate our our, our potential wage offer. And then we look at the consequences of that and say, well, that can't be right because I'm going to change my mind now. I'll do something else. And the, the resting point of this would be where all firms, all wage posts generate indifference. There's no incentive to change. And it's, it's not the same thing as a single firm calling out a wage. There, it, and I told you, there's a model of a, of a monopsonist employee, employer that would do that. And then that would be a different outcome. You could just maximize that term before with respect to, to W and get the, uh, the maximum extraction. Right? So and that would be, of course, B. Right? That's exactly the point. Um, so this is a way of trying to figure out why the frictions give rise to this magical distribution. Because you, you've always got these losses. So, pe so even if you're, you pay a really high wage, you're going to lose workers. So th there's, there's not a... Um, you're not going to have a... We'll see in a second. Um, as long as those, those are not trivial probabilities we've assumed, you're, you're going to have, you're gonna have a, 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 an equilibrium that is not the, the diamond paradox. So mathematically, the only reason that we end up with different wages is because we assume that this distribution f of w exists and it becomes part of the yeah the the wage. So we kind of we don't really it's, it's explain it's, how f rises. We no, say it's, it's there and it influences the wage that each firm. The, pa the, the paper makes the very convincing argument. It's the only potent, It's the only candidate equilibrium that survives. It is immune to the <coughs> diamond paradox because you're always having job losers because of this lambda. 
And if you didn't have that, we'll show that, then the model sort of collapses to, di to the diamond paradox. Sure, but I mean, does it really solve the paradox? Of it does. It certainly does. I mean, I think it's pretty clear if, if, um, if there's no risk of job loss, then the distribution wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, and job loss can also just be losing a worker for retirement reasons. I mean, in the real world, you lose workers because of the demographic of your firm. So you always have to replace people. And you also lose people because your firm goes out of business, or your enterprise goes out of business, or your plan goes out of business. OK, I think it's convincing. <laughs> you can convince yourself. I, think, I mean, um, it's, it's really considered. Uh, but again, the irony is that it took so long for this paper to be published. I've never figured that out. Why it took 10 years to publish this paper. Um, it's a legend. And I remember seeing it when it came out as a working paper. And I said, oh, this is uh, really interesting. But I, did, I didn't. Uh, it just kind of floored me to find out that it took so long. It was rejected in many journals. Yeah. Uh, I just find it. Uh really hard to believe why it's optimal for a firm, like for the sake only of making higher profit, to post thing to post like a, a wage below uh, this reservation wage or like so little wage. But you don't have that yet. We, we don't have it yet. Okay. In this setup, they're equal. I mean, they're, they're, there's the lowest post is equal to B. Okay. Okay. And that's and, and I actually say that here. Yeah, yeah. Just like. But you can you can change the model because it's just simply because. The firm knows that a worker is desperate because in the case of alpha one greater than alpha zero, then getting into, the, into, into a job it has a really, it just opens up this new vista of offers. So it's got to be more valuable than sitting on your can and searching. What do you mean? Like That's an unemployed person. Yeah, it's just like if we have like two firms situation, one is posting the, this B and one the posting is a little bit higher than B, then a worker with the that already has this B is indifferent. So I might think that he would apply to the higher paying job, higher paying firm. There's no application in this model. It's, it's, remember, the, the arrival probability is like a, it's like this vulture just coming in and grabbing, uh, you know, Not yet. grabbing the worker and giving them a, 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 an o option. Right. And the allocation of these these birds are, is, is completely random. It's, yeah. it's lambda. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's the, it, you call it a friction, call it whatever you want, but it's just a sort of, or the, the, the the Calvo Ferry, you know, in macro, we have this crazy Calvo Ferry. It's the same idea. It's just some sort of random incidents. Um, and if you want to get into the micro, micro of that, it's, it's, it's really tricky because every effort by a firm um, to make an offer to somebody has implications that are very complicated. Um, and we have heterogeneity within firms. You know, that also creates problems. So, you know, it creates jealousy. That's one reason why firms like to have very, very, I mean, well, not always true. I mean, if you want to have different wage uh, policies for different for different workers, you want to make it probably intransparent. You don't want workers to know about it. Mm -hmm. So I know there are companies that, that, that forbid their workers from talking to each other about, about pay. Of course, how you enforce that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, if you do it on social media, you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I mean, it, again, labor economics has really been enriched by this, this model. We have to have to think really hard about the about the uh, implications. It's not it's not perfect, but um, please read the paper. I mean, it's a hard read, and I, I promised you something I didn't do yet, which is a translation table, because they use different notations. It's a bit it's a bit worse. I mean, it's a bit uh, troublesome. It, I mean, they were the original paper, so you say, well, why don't we use their notation? Well, the fact is, the literature's moved on, and I, I really like this paper by Scheimer, uh, Robert. Rogers and China, right? And it's basically, a, it's, it sets a lot of symbols for me in the whole course. I, I, so if you want to you go back and read the original paper, um, and then one of the things that, that Mortensen, uh, Burnett and Mortensen do is that they, they normalize um, A0 and A1, because they're both constants. So you can express it in terms of one and a ratio of those two. So they have another crazy symbol in there. That just uh, It's the intensity differential between the arrival rates. And it's true, that's the key thing in this model. If you look at, look at the, uh, um, when, we, when we finish, we'll talk about A0 and A1 again, because we've set them equal. And then it's about the ratio of A1 to A0. It's like the, the competitive advantage of being in 
employed in terms of getting the arrivals. So, and, because it's all exogenous, right? Okay, so we have a formula here. We have a formula for F. Isn't that cool? Look at it. It, does, it depends on what? It depends on the frictions. It depends on productivity. It depends on the alternative, uh, the valuation of, of unemployment by the worker. Okay, so that's, that's it's still not quite there yet because we need to have a... To make this a genuine CDF, what do we need? Three things. The bottom, the top, and the positive first derivative with the non-negative. Remember, if the, if the, that's the density. F prime is the density. So if, if F prime is zero, that means you've, you've literally got a density that's equal to zero. If big F prime is equal to zero, then the density is zero, and that's, that's not something we're going to see in this model. So non-decreasing implies for me increasing. We need an upper bound. We haven't done that yet, so we have to solve for it. What is the, because the firm doesn't want to post too much. The firm could post the moon, and then the firm make losses forever. You know, do that. So whatever the firm, whatever bounds the firm's potential set of wage offers has to be giving the same amount of profit in expected terms as the worst post. When you get one worker, I'm married forever, but I'm not making any money. But I'm not going to be losing money. I'm not going to make a post that implies an expected loss. Why would you do that? Right? That's stupid. So the upper bound is just given by the value of W upper bar that gives me the same profits as the, the stingiest offer I can imagine. And you can solve for it, and it looks like that. It's literally a function of all the parameters in the model. Y is given to us. There's no heterogeneity in this model. B is given to us. Workers are all the same when they're unemployed. Alpha is the arrival rate, and lambda is, this, is, the, is the job destruction or the, the match destruction rate. So it's a very simple formula. You could solve for it. I spent a few hours this weekend <laughs> plotting this for you, just to show you, and in in, uh, if you want, I can post the, it's, it's a simple Excel spreadsheet. It just implements the Morton's and Pissarides model for different values of alpha, um, uh, lambda and uh, productivities. So you can see that um, indeed the, the offer distribution, and again, this is using, using the parameters of the model to derive an F and using the F to derive a G. So this J F and the G are consistent with each other. Okay? They imply by the same theory, they're completely endogenous, and they arise as a function of what I've assumed for lambda, alpha, B, and Y. And you can see it looks pretty cool, doesn't it? I mean, first off, we have stochastic dominance, right? So G stochastically dominates um, first order F. You see that F is uh, not a trivial distribution. I could put more curvature on that if I want, but it's, it's it look, but does that look like, hmm? does that look like anything we see in, in the data? Well, um, no. <laughs> so, so G, uh, if, if I go if I go to the, the, the Nuremberg and spend some time in Nuremberg and get the um, the data on the hourly wage that are paid to German workers, male and female, I don't get something that looks like that. Okay, so that's kind of a. Uh, but then again, the world is not perfect, perfectly homo homo homogeneous. So I infer. Although I love this model, it's not going to be enough to generate, and this is, an, this is a, something that we realized uh, 20, 25 years ago, but it's a start. Frictions combined with sufficient heterogeneity are enough to give us what we, we observe in Nuremberg. It's, and you can estimate it. So there are people now in the, in the last 10, 20 years have actually, uh, some very, very smart people have estimated um, the, the degrees of different types of heterogeneity that a pure matching model without any monopsony, uh, big monopsony firm power uh, would imply. And then, of course, there are models that, that have some and, or have firms that have positive mass, etc. So, you know, this is just a, again, just to get you excited about this. Uh, sorry. So this is, this, is, this is what the real world looks like. I, you know, if I, if I look at the data, um, 
it's probably something like a log normal or log Parisian type of, of, of CDF, which means that, you know, and I, it, this is, I just did this with my eyeball, but it's just a, it's just a, it's just a guess basically, but it's going to look like the CDF of something that's kind of a, a Parisian or, or a normal distribution. It's going to, it's going <clears> to <throat> start at some base, which, and the base is not only, it's not, it's much lower than we think. So there are people who are kind of desperate. Think of a mini jobber, you know, working and building maintenance uh, legally, still, probably not a great wage. The person is probably working, you know, for, I mean, now we have a minimum wage in Germany, but, it, you know, before that it was like three, hour, three euros an hour, four euros an hour. You can see it. It's, the, it's in the data. These are people who are paying social security contributions for that. There are people who are illegally working, they're paying less than that. They're getting paid less than that. Okay, but it's going to look like this. It's going to have a, a slow um, rate of increase and it's going to rise very fast where the, the, the mass of the distribution is and then it'll, there aren't many people earning a lot of money at the top. So that might be, have to do with a scarcity of productivity or, or a, um, other things. Okay, it could also have, and, and you know, again, we'll, we'll explain, the model is, is so rich already. Um, uh, we can, if we can observe this, we can back out um, some sort of offer distribution that is consistent with G, and then we can ask what kind of productivity or utility and unemployment uh, could generate those distribution, that distribution we observe. And you also have to remember that the labor market is, is not a, a, a one bathtub. Some people are in one bathtub by, by virtue of their age. You can't change your age. You can't change your, your race. So this is discrimination we, we don't like. But if it does exist, it's going to lead to a different bathtub, right? Because you can't change that. Maybe gender related. So there might be gender discrimination. All these things will lead to different bathtubs lead to different unemployment rates. So this is a proper description of, say, a certain type of job market where there's a little bit of intransparency or um, impermeability between the job markets. That's the proper way of doing it. And of course, we've assumed all that away. Okay, but that's, but that's life. Life is full of heterogeneity. Okay. So that's a comment on, on that. So the, 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 the next part of of the course, we'll be trying to maybe pierce that that veil and try to find out what what type of heterogeneity. And this model is very clear. There are only two types of heterogeneity that come into question. Um, one is related to productivity of the match, and the other is related to um, utility. And when I say productivity of match, I, I mean productivity of the worker. You could even introduce productivity of the match as a as some sort of um, interaction of the two, but here the model would imply the worker um, has a high productivity or low productivity, or the worker has a high value of um, unemployment or not. And that would give rise to a, already to very interesting uh, potential op uh, explanations of what we really observe. Before we do that, let's uh, let's expand the model as in Rogers and Chimer Wright. Okay, so uh, actually as in Bur Burdett and Mortensen, because Burdett and Mortensen carry through this to the to the bitter end, which is to assume that uh, the arrival rates are different. So they could be higher or lower. So you could have see in the 1960s and 70s, people said search cannot be an explanation of unemployment because. Well, it depends on your political opinion. Back then, it was very political. So a lot of people said, search cannot be an explanation of unemployment because unemployed people um, have um, a lot more time on their hands. Okay, so it's, it's clearly more attractive to um, accept... No, I got it backwards. Um, because you get more offers on the job, and it's more attractive to accept the job offer and therefore that cannot be an explanation. So that was considered a way of discounting the theory. And then uh, the search 
proponents would say, well, actually, if you're unemployed, you have the whole day. So if you want to have a job, you have a lot of time. Um, if you're working, it's difficult. So they would argue that maybe alpha zero is greater than alpha one. So you can tell different stories. Other people would say, well, maybe it's just a completely different story. Maybe, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe uh, the, the arrival rates are related to people and there's discrimination. So, you know, there's a big, there's a big discussion. But we can, we can consider, at least in the, in the narrow dimension of, of Burdett and Mortensen, uh, what can we do with alpha zero and alpha one if we make them different? Because we started with imposing equality. Well, if you, if you want to derive F under those conditions, we know that the, um, the reservation wage is a function of alpha zero. It's implicitly a function of alpha one because the reservation wage will be based on the knowledge of getting access to a different job market, you know, a, a different arrival rate. That's the only reason you would care about that. But we still have this logic that the reservation wage will be strictly greater than B if the arrival rate in unemployment is higher than the arrival rate on the job and vice versa. And if you have problems remembering that, just think, you know, why would you accept a, a job that pays so little? Well, to get access to more job offers. So that would imply a reservation wage below, below B. But the firm would still, uh, in a posting mode, would never post. Um, it would never post a wage in an equilibrium that's less than B, because an arrival for a worker in a job already that's less than B would be a, would be rejected immediately. So there's, I mean, you have lots of expected profits if you get a worker like a slave, but it's not going to happen. So the firm always pays at least B. Okay, so think about that. Uh, and under those conditions, it, it allows us to pin down, uh, and it's, the algebra is not so difficult. Um, we can solve for F. And now you see, you go, it wasn't. Well, it's the same formula. No, because alpha zero is different from alpha one. And alpha one still comes through the back door because it affects, alpha zero comes through the back door uh, because it affects the reservation wage. Okay, and you can... This is the, a tricky one. Um, you can uh, use this new F and integrate using the formulas that we already derived to get F, and you get this um, surprisingly uh, simple weighted average. It's a, it's a weighted average again of B and Y, except now it only involves uh, alpha one, and it involves a differential. So this differential, this last term in the denominator is exactly the reason why Mort Burdett and Mortensen uh, stress the ratio of alpha um, one to alpha zero as being a relative datum. Okay. And you can rewrite that if you want. And it's kind of, again, we always have this in labor uh, and search and matching is that uh, the wage we observe has to be some sort of, has some relationship to this fallback position for the, for the worker and for the firm. It, there's no bargaining going on here, but it's kind of like that. I mean, it's, somehow you've got this surplus. Um, there's no marginal decision in terms of work effort or firm capital investment or whatever. It's just yes or no. And then obviously there's going to be some mix of the two, depending on how, um, how unwilling the worker is to work. That's B. Think of that as, you know, some people call that laziness. Right? Or some people call that, you know, enjoying life, work-life balance. <laughs> and why is how productive is this is this guy, right? So it has to be somewhere in between those two. Yeah. No, I was just, I think, uh, I got it, but I was just wondering on the, the values of alpha zero and alpha one. So they're between zero and one, and if they're one, then no, it's like infinite. No, not, not, not a Poisson model. I mean, they can actually, it's, it's, a, it's an intensity for dt. Um, but they're always going to be positive. At least we assume that they're positive. Mm -hmm. And um, you always have to be careful in interpreting them as a probability because yeah. of the, 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 it's for dt. So, but for a small change in time, yeah, you could do, you could do what that. What value would they have to be so that the friction ceases to exist? That's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> but we already did it kind of intuitively when I did this. Remember, I, 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 I generated this for you. Yeah. So you can see this is just like 0.1. What does that mean? Is that I mean, it's a rate, so 
let's, let's say it's a rate of arrivals per month. Okay, that's just a way of measuring it, but of course we're letting the period go to smaller than a month. It's, it's really, really small, but if I took a month's worth of that, it would be something like 0.1, if it's linear. Right? It's, then uh, you would get one offer uh, every 10 months or something like that. Well, I like to think of this as like, um, yeah, right. No, it's like, one, yeah, exactly. If, if, if it's a monthly model, you have, to, you have to specify the unit of time. It could be annual, but again, you know, you start thinking about annual, a lot of people get several offers in a year. Yeah. So, you, I mean, again, that's the whole Poisson magic is you're, you're, you're measuring it using this unit of time. It's arbitrary, but we, we shrink the, the actual time under, under consideration to a very small change. That's the magic of calculus. Okay, so, um, yeah, so you asked about the, these special cases, but just let's just let this sink in now. This is all about market friction. The whole course is about market frictions, you know, labor markets with search and matching. So look at that. The reservation wage only depends on these productivities, these evaluations of time, and the friction. So this is, um, this is kind of the, the solution, one solution to the diamond paradox. Right? And you can see that by letting... Um, some of the parameters go to different places. So we can always let these Poisson intensities go to zero. We, we don't want to let them equal zero because we've assumed that they're relevant. So we'll just let them get arbitrarily close. If you let alpha one, which is the arrival rate um, in employment, go to zero, that means that once you accept the job, that's it forever. Okay? And the reservation wage is going to be, you know, you're going to be really... You know, once you get that offer, you're there forever. So you're going to get you're going to get more and more choosy. So the reservation wage is going to go very close to the top. You're going to wait for that Bill Gates offer, and someday you might get it. Okay. Um, and the diamond spike um, would imply that firms know this, but the firms know that the worker always only gets B. So as firms learn about this, they're going to start offering B. So the only equilibrium we can have is basically <laughs> all the firms offer close to B. So that's the spike. That's the diamond paradox. I mean, workers are really look like they're incredibly lazy, but it's not that they're lazy. They just they'd like to get this fantastic job, but it's not going to happen in equilibrium because no firm would be stupid enough to pay that. Okay, so I mean it's just not an equilibrium. So it's <clears throat> along the way to that spike, you'd have a lot of mass, very, very close to B. So that would be like the United States. <laughs> um, that's a very bad joke. Okay, so on the other hand, you can imagine alpha one getting really high. So once you get into a job, you just get it loaded up. So um, the disappearance of the relative other friction would be that everybody uh, knows that's going to happen. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, yeah, it's the competitive, the competitive outcome. So workers, it's like giving workers a whole lot of power. And it's one of the reasons, in my view, that uh, software companies in California make workers sign non-compete agreements <laughs> to prevent this from happening. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of money out there if you can get the, I mean, these, work, these guys, these programmers are very productive. Right, so there's a lot of competition for them. Um, and that would be like a, a high alpha one. <clears throat> um, I already told you the biggest drawback is this, this distribution, which is horrible, right? It's, it doesn't look like anything like we see in the data. So we, we kind of want to work at that. But if we know where G comes from, and we know where F comes from, they come from each other, then in some sense, if I know what G is, I can know what F has to look like. What kind of theory can I write down that gives me the F? that I need. And there may be many different theories. Right? There are many different ways of doing that. Okay, so this is the opens the world of heterogeneous workers and firms and all sorts of other things we could talk about. <clears throat> so I urge you now with this knowledge to go back to Rogers and Scheimer Wright and look at it again and now think about um, but if you really like this you should go and look at Burdett Mortensen just to understand how they do it. I'm going to give you the, the, the broad brush strokes right now. Okay. 
So heterogeneity has to be part of the story, meaning that either workers have heterogeneous valuations of leisure, firms are the same, but the firms kind of can see that if they post a very low uh, wage, they may uh, we'll, we'll still get some workers, but those are the workers who are kind of uh, desperate. When I say desperate, it means that they, they don't have the work-life balance. They really just a workaholic type, so they don't have any valuation of leisure. You can put all sorts of judgments on it. You can just say, um, you know, who wants to do that anyway? Who wants to put a judgment on it? Just some people like to work, some people le like to work less. <coughs> so that will give us that will give us what we want. <coughs> on the other hand, you can also assume that firms um, just are di have different productivities. The workers know that. The firms know that the workers know that. And everybody wants to work at Microsoft. Everyone wants to work at Google. Nobody wants to work at, at, at Zolando. <laughs> no, actually, they do want to work at Zolando. They don't want to work at, at, at my Lehrstuhl. <laughs> OK. So, um, and Dale Mortensen actually, uh, when he was alive, came to Humboldt. He was my guest here. And he actually wrote his, part of his book on uh, using the Danish wage distribution. Why Denmark? Does anybody know? Why, why? I mean, Denmark's a great, great country. Lots of labor mobility? No. Um, probably more than, than Germany because they have, they don't have job protection. And they have a very cushy social system. So if you lose your job, <coughs> at least for the first few months, it's, it's pretty good. I think for low-paid wor low workers, it's like 85% of the previous wage. So it's, and they've start putting pressure on you after about six months. And now I think they've been putting pressure on you before you lose your job. <laughs> so it's get, you know, these, these systems tend to cost money, so you have to be careful. But you know, the reason why the Danes uh, were attractive to Dale Mortensen was because they had the data. And they gave him everything. Because in Denmark, when you come to Denmark, you get a number, and that's it's like your number for, for the rest of your life. Every contact with the economy you have, you have to give your, your number. It's much more intense than the American Social Security number, and the Germans don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Germany have a dot and Schutz number. <laughs> so um, using that information, uh, Mortensen was able to uh, construct the uh, empirical wage distribution um, for Denmark, uh, for various labor markets, and was able to, to try to make some intelligent inference on that. You can even estimate the model. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about some of those ingredients. Um, so we're going to, potential dimensions of heterogeneity already talked about, Y and B. Um, in the original paper, uh, Bernard and Mortensen spent more time and, and we're able to do more with the uh, with the latter. Um, we'll start with that first, and then we can talk about some of the progress that's been made in recent in recent years. <clears throat> so we we'll start with B. Um, B is not income and unemployment. It's income and unemployment plus the monetary valuation of everything else you do with your free time, including work at home with your family, taking care of loved ones. Um, you know, this could be quite expensive if you have a an elderly uh, relative in your house, you got to pay for that if you want to work because you can't do it yourself. So the home production is, <clears throat> is a big chunk of that. And home production, of course, can be, can be portioned out. You don't have to work uh, the whole time cleaning your house. You can work part-time. Uh, so, but that's not in this model. So you're not in the model for short part-time work. It's, you're in the model for a job, and then this is just the value of all the stuff you could have been doing at home if you, were, if you weren't working. So let's do what we always do. Let's, let's just assume there's a CDF out there that, that kind of covers this picture. Everyone's different, so B is no longer a constant. It's, a random, it's like a random variable. It's coming from a distribution. So if I just put my hand in the, in the unemployment pool and I pulled somebody out, I would get a B that could be high. That would be a person who doesn't want to work very much because lots of time commitments, loves leisure, doesn't care about material goods, whatever. And then you can have other people, maybe people from other country who just arrived here and really want to make some money to send to their, their folks, or um, people who 
just a workaholics, they have, would have a low B. And we're going to assume that, that this is human nature, and that I don't want to explain any more, I don't want to comment on it, it's just, it's just on this support, it's closed between B lower bar and B upper bar. And you can see, I can assume anything I want on this. I mean, I just, I mean, I have to go out and ask uh, people in the street, how do you, you know, how do you feel about this and work? And you have to ask the right questions, and you never will get the question quite right. So you won't really always capture all the. So in some sense, maybe this is impossible to assess. But you know, people have prejudice, and they say, oh, these people are lazy, or these people, oh, he really likes to work. I mean, who knows? But that's that's driving this model. The shape of H will drive. Um, everything in this in this alternative. So this means that if if I uh, post a wage, and an unemployed person encounters my posted wage, uh, it can reject it for many reasons. One reason is that uh, the wage is too low, and the other is my <laughs> my B is too high. Okay, so you know that that adds a lot of interesting. Now you understand why we have this uh, this interest in alpha zero and alpha one. <clears throat> and um, all the same, nevertheless, worker job matches are equally productive. Okay, so that, again, we're just shutting down the, the heterogeneity on the productivity side. Some people actually describe this as productivity. And you, it's not quite, it doesn't give you the same, quite, same flavor, but um, here the notion is the, the worker actually puts... The, the money where their mouth is, they basically, they reject a job if it's not attractive enough from their perspective. I, I'm not so sure I'd like to call it productivity because um, the firm by construction has the same ex post productivity and you could, I guess you could interpret it as, as the, uh, the effective shirking that goes on once you get the worker on the job. But the, the worker will never enter that employment relationship, so you can't call it shirking. And I really don't think productivity is the right way to describe it either. So the, the, the productivity discussion is a different one. We'll talk about it next week. There are better ways to do this. Okay, so um, let's continue to assume what we had before. So we'll make this as easy as possible. We'll, we'll shut down all the other interesting actions that you can have. So alpha, one, alpha zero and alpha one are equal. And that implies immediately that for any individual worker, the reservation wage has to exceed their personal, personal, private uh, assessment of leisure. So that's why there are potentially uh, lots of reservation wages in, in the pool. So that's one attractive aspect of this model is every worker will have a different re reservation wage. Every worker will solve the problem um, conditional on an offer distribution, which is important. That's the whole theory is based on, because we have to start from scratch now. Each worker has a B, and the worker knows the B. It's completely known information to that worker. And uh, if B is low, the worker's going to have a low reservation wage. And if it's high, it's going to have a high reservation wage. And there's n this differential arrival rate is not important in this model, just to make it easy to, to derive the answer. Um, we're going to stick to that. Okay, so everybody understand? The reservation wage, you can put an I on it for the ith worker. And it's going to depend on that worker's position in this H distribution. So that really adds a lot of interesting action. And the original discussion of reservation wages in the United States, especially in the heated 1970s, was that workers who don't accept job offers have a high valuation of leisure. Okay, so... This model it immediately admits that potential heterogeneity. So the, the distribution of unemployment um, or the, the, the mass of unemployment is a function of the, the mass of workers who have valuations of leisure that are higher than um, this reservation wage. That was kind of a, um, under the assumption it's a single offer that's coming from the, um, from the outside. But that's, of course, not advanced in the sense that it doesn't incorporate the, the mutuality, mutual equilibrium properties of F and G. So again, this is just, just to get you understanding why this is already very, dis I mean, the, the pure old-fashioned 
um, partial equilibrium view of, uh, of the reservation wage model was it was because workers, if workers reject job offers, it's probably because they're, they're lazy or because they, they just have a, they have too much time on their hands, <laughs> they have too much, uh, too many, too high evaluation of, of their alternatives. And um, that does not need to be the case. We've learned in, in this course until now that you just need to have the friction. But um, adding this H adds a whole new dimension of what, what I can explain, because that's going to feed back into the offer distribution. You have a question? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask if it's just a fancy way of saying that those people are lazy that don't accept the... I, no, I, I try to be very explicit. I don't want to say that at all, because I think you know, if, you, if you live in a world where health care is, is, um, is poor and you have to take care of your, your relatives, your parents, or if you have children, you have poor daycare. These are all things that the household has to produce, which means no work uh, time for me. Uh, and, that's, um, and that explains why you have to be careful of making inference on the Danish distribution, because the Danes have an incredibly generous uh, daycare system. It's all completely subsidized by the government. It's like the government giving you some income and unemployment. Um, not. So it's like reducing the income and unemployment because you don't have to pay it, right? That's sorry, I did it backwards. So you know, um, and that's why the, the Danish, um, you know, the Danish female labor force participation is so high is because it's for women especially it's easy to get back into the um, into the labor force. <clears throat> okay, so you know, policy can change. Um, B lower bar can change the whole distribution of B. So I don't want again. That's why I don't want to call it laziness. I think it's really a very deep discussion about what people do with their time when they're not working. And we know that as we move beyond the, you know, we move into this new age of internet, uh, Zoom, and, and home office and everything, it's all very fluid. And people are working less, actually. People, a lot of people are refusing to do things that they did before because you can, there are more attractive ways of doing stuff that gives you income. Okay, so powerful model. Okay, so the, the second, the first line, um, or the second line here, the, the formula, the first formula, would would be an implication of the the unemployment rate. Something wrong here. Sorry. This is, this is a, an important formula that I'll explain next time, which is the mass of unemployed people that are willing to accept a wage offer that is less than or equal to um, W, given that the wage offer distribution out there that the workers understand is F. Okay, so the, the, the wage offer distribution only depends on the, the model characteristics and on the worker's characteristics. The worker gets an offer, it's random. So it's basically going to have a, it's going to be a function of the shape of H, and that's why this dH, the density of um, of, in, of pecuniary income in unemployment uh, is so important. So already you can use that you can use that attribute of the model to see how you could you could use the discriminant you could use this this. Um, I think very politicized description of unemployment as a function of, of the shape of age, right? Because the model does imply that. Um, and each, to understand the logic is, is really intuitive, I think. It, you know, each worker, it's like Lucas said, you're unemployed, you have an asset, unemployment, and if you get an offer, you can turn it down or you can accept it. And if you accept it, it's going to imply a capital gain. But if I allow workers to be different, the capital gain will be different, right? So for, you know, if you're kind of, if you have a high value, if you're, if you're a, a woman and you have very poor um, daycare alternatives and you have lots of children, then a job is gonna have to pay you a lot of money to get you to, to leave, okay? So that's just another way of saying that it depends on the, the allocation of, of mass uh, in the uh, density, um, or in the, yeah, in the density of this uh, B. And then you could also have people who just don't just, you know, get offers, but they're not attractive because I have to pay for all this uh, extra stuff if I leave. And that means that B, um, understanding what B is, in this model, it's, it shouldn't be judgmental. 
it's not about laziness. It's not about welfare. It's not about unemployment benefits. It's really about alternatives. And those can be quite different. So you can you can talk about cutting um, you can talk about cutting unemployment insurance or raising unemployment insurance, or you can think about ways of increasing access to um, um, daycare, care for other family members, or uh, even even increasing. Um, Subsidies to job search, all these things that can, can be implied. Okay, so I probably went too fast, um, but that's all I have to say, I think, today. I have some key concepts. Distribution we observe now has a whole different flavor because it involves, it's going to Im imply the possibility of reverse engineering on F. Remember, F we can't observe. G, we have a pretty good shot at observing. Um, and you should probably go home and think about that. You could think about if you knew that the G is log normal, uh, what would that imply? And it can't be exactly log normal because we, it's, 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 a, it's a truncated distribution. Also by construction, it has a lower bound. You know, we think it does, at least in the theory. Um, so what kind of, what kind of uh, theories can I use to generate uh, the right offer distribution? Um, we talked about wage posting, a central part of this model. Competitive wage posting, um, special special aspect of this theory, the firms do not have market power beyond their own wage post. They can't coordinate with other, other firms, and, and that's why. But the value of that we can derive. We can see it. So if all the, the little, little guys could collude and have a, some sort of collusive outcome, they could probably... Um, be like, like, like a monopsonist. It's a nice way of getting the paradox uh, solved. It's certainly not the only way, but it's uh, the leading way in this, in this field. And I think uh, you can think of this as a great example of, of learning um, how corner oak price setting uh, applies to the labor market. <coughs> and um, the equilibrium concept gave rise to, uh, to this this rational policy by the firm ex ante. And again, uh, the, the, the argument to describe this uh, wage offer distribution is going to be one of um, looking at small deviations from the, your post W. Do I gain or do I lose by making it a slightly higher or slightly lower wage offer? And the answer is in the equilibrium, no. So then that would character that imposing that condition on the entire distribution gives rise to the to the uh, to the outcome, and it only depends on the market frictions, right? So that's the the, the the aha moment. That's enough to generate, but they all have to be positive. We can't we can't let um, um, alpha one go to go to one or alpha. If alpha one goes to zero, we go back to the original search model, and then we have the problem of um, the diamond paradox. Okay, so we, we, we scratch the surface. Next week we'll do, we'll do it in more detail and we'll talk about productivity differences, some of the more modern ways of looking at that. And then we'll start to make our first leap into a different type of model, which is the, the model of um, directed search. So this is when, when the firm or the worker can decide where they want to do their search. And you have different pools, different lakes or different different labor markets to look at, bathtubs. Okay, and you have a similar type of logic there. In the equilibrium, there's gonna be some indifference implied between going to one bathtub or the other bathtub. Okay, great, thanks for listening. <laughs>